Okay, and the mask professor is on the air once more. I certainly hope that this uh, video is coming out the right way around on the little monitor attached to the camera everything is mirror uh, reversed. So that makes it exciting. This is midterm week. I'm sorry I missed the class yesterday. Uh, we were interviewing candidates for environmental engineering and I think we've got some uh, great people lined up to hire. Anyway, let's plunge boldly into Material Transport Systems. <laughs> okay, well, of course, material handling is a huge, uh, uh, is a huge consideration uh, for any enterprise. Uh, even something like a bank or an insurance company has to worry about moving the product around the facility. All right, so here we have our um, uh, uh, we have our uh, illustration that we've seen before. Uh, and you'll notice that we have material handling and identification uh, as part of our manufacturing system. So we define material handling as the movement, protection, storage, and control of materials and products throughout the process of manufacture and distribution, consumption, and disposal. Uh, this is uh, estimated uh, to represent 20 to 25 percent of our total manufacturing labor cost in the U.S. Uh, however, uh, in my experience, that may be a low estimate. Um, Uh, because, of course, transportation is one of the great wastes identified in lean production. So, when we handle materials, we want to be safe. We want to be efficient. We want to do it at a low cost. In a timely manner. And accurately to get the right materials in the right quantities to the right location. That just-in-time ideal that we talk about in lean production. And we want all of this to be without damage to our materials or our products. Logistics is concerned with the acquisition, movement, storage, and distribution of materials and products to satisfy customer demand. So we have two categories of logistics. Uh, first is lo external logistics. So that is transportation and all the related activities outside of our facility. So, in other words, it's between different geographic locations. Uh, these uh, guys are listing as five traditional modes, rail, truck, air, ship, and pipeline. Um, of course, now we may have to add drone to, uh, uh, to that list. Internal logistics means material handling and storage within our facility. 
So we have five categories of material handling equipment. There is transportation equipment. We're moving the materials inside our factory, warehouse, or other type of facility, right? This can be anything from uh, a person is hand carrying parts or paperwork up through uh, having a big truck moving, uh, uh, moving our materials. Positioning equipment handles parts at a location, uh, right? So often we have parts that are too large to manhandle, as it were, or we want to be sure that we have uh, only one person having to move it, so we have positioning equipment. Unit load formation equipment, that's both containers to hold the materials and the equipment that is used to load and package those containers. Storage equipment, where we store materials or we have access to those materials when, we, when it is required. And identification and control equipment, to keep, uh, to identify and keep track of our materials that are being moved and stored. So more and more, uh, we use barcodes uh, to record uh, the movement of parts and uh, products and equipment. Uh, we use RFID tags and other technologies of this type. So the design considerations in material handling. Uh, first of all, what is the characteristic of the materials to be moved? Uh, what are the quantities and distances that those materials will have to be moved? What is our type of production facility? And what is the available budget? Of course, we have to remember always that these are economic decisions. When we talk about material characteristics, um, first of all, is it a solid, a liquid, or a gas? Uh, that is going to make a huge difference in how we transport it. What is its size? Uh, what is the weight of the material? What is the shape of it? Uh, uh, for example, many of you may have seen on the highways the transportation of uh, wind turbines. Well, when we're talking just one blade of a wind turbine, they have to have a specialized rig because it is way oversized what would ordinarily be allowed on the highway uh, in the ordinary way. What is the condition of the material? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it wet? Is it dirty? Uh, is it super fragile? Oh, sorry, that was on the next one. Risk of damage. So is it fragile? Is it something that's brittle? Is it something that's sturdy that can take a lot of knocks? And what is our safety risk? Uh, is it explosive? Is it flammable? Is it something that is toxic or corrosive? All of these things have to be taken into account for when we are moving things. All right, so we think about our material movement. First of all, what is the flow rate? The flow rate is the amount of material that we move per unit time. So that might be in pieces per hour, 
pallet loads per hour, tons per hour. The other consideration is are we moving this as individual units, as batches, or is it continuous? Next is routing. What are our pickup and drop off locations? What are the distances we have to move? Do we have variations in our routing? And what are the conditions along the route? And scheduling. What is the timing of each delivery? We don't want to deliver early and we don't want to deliver late. We want it to be right on time. So we need that prompt delivery and we may use buffer stocks to mitigate in case there are late deliveries. So when we think about this in terms of our plant layout, we have to think of our material handling equipment when we are doing the plant layout design problem. Okay, and this is something that I talk about in facility design uh, so that we can uh, uh, incorporate these ideas as we are thinking about how we make our facility. So we have a correlation between our layout type and the material handling equipment. So if the plant layout type is a process plant, our material handling equipment may be hand trucks, forklift trucks, or automatically guided vehicles. If it is a product, we may be using conveyors for product flow, uh, or we may, uh, we may be using trucks and automatically guided vehicles to deliver the parts to stations or even our products depending on what they are, how far apart they are, etc. With fixed position type of plant layout, we're going to be thinking in terms of cranes, hoists, and industrial uh, trucks. All right, so we come back to the principle of the unit load. The unit load should be as large as practical for the material handling system that moves it and stores it. Uh, so our unit load is the mass that we move or handle at one time. So we might use uh, unit loads because we want to handle multiple items simultaneously, reduce the number of trips required, uh, reduce our loading and unloading times, and to decrease our product damage, right? All good reasons. All right, so unit load containers, it might be a wooden pallet that we uh, strap uh, one or more units to, might be a pallet box, it might be just a tote box, um, right? But we want to carefully choose our, our unit load containers to support our production the best way we can. When we think about our material transport equipment, we have five categories. One is industrial trucks. Those could be forklifts, they could be little uh, mini pickup type trucks, uh, automatically guided vehicles, uh, Usually those are low uh, 
uh, robotic type uh, uh, vehicles that follow a wire buried in the floor or, so, or some other system that keeps them positioned on a path. They might be rail guided vehicles. Uh, uh, the example they give is monorails. That's a, a possibility. Uh, if we're talking about rail guided, the best kind would be where the rails are overhead so they're not a trip hazard. Could be conveyors. Uh, conveyors could be of the uh, uh, belt type conveyors or uh, uh, other types of conveyors. And then cranes or, and hoists are also a possibility. When we talk about industrial trucks, we have two categories, non-powered, where human workers are pushing or pulling the load. So it could be a hand truck, it could be a pallet jack, uh, or it could be powered, where it's either self-propelled or guided or driven by a human operator, uh, right? So you could have something that is self-propelled that is closer to an automatically guided vehicle. Um, uh, you could have one that's driven by a human operator. And the example they give is a forklift truck. Of course, forklift trucks come in all different sizes and shapes for different purposes. Right, so here we have non-powered. We have a two-wheel hand truck. We have a four-wheel dolly. Uh, uh, and you'll notice at one end we have um, a little... Um, uh, I'm going to call it a lug that we could either hook something to pull that along or attach it into a train of little dollies. And then we have a hand operated uh, pallet truck uh, here at the bottom. So, powered trucks, uh, they have a walkie truck here at the top. That is just an advance on the pallet jack where it actually supplies its own power for movement. The human operator still guides it. Uh, a forklift truck uh, or a towing tractor, right? And again, that could operate in conjunction with our four-wheel dolly type of um, uh, type of transport. So automatically guided vehicles, um, automatically guided vehicle systems are material handling systems that have independently operated self-propelled vehicles that are guided along defined path, uh, pathways. So we can have towing vehicles uh, that pull a driverless train, right? So that's used to move heavy loads over long distance. We can have pallet trucks that move palletized loads on predetermined routes. And unit load carriers that will move our unit load between stations in a facility. Um, Automatically guided vehicles are uh, a great way to go. Uh, however, we must take into account the maintenance that's going to be needed and are the human beings going to interfere with how the uh, AGVs work. Uh, I have worked in a facility where when the workers felt like they were getting too many deliveries, they would actually put a cup over the sensor so that it would read that the uh, station was busy 
and the AGVs would start backing up. All right, so here we have a driverless train. You'll notice the front, there's a safety bumper. If it runs into something, it will stop the AGV. Uh, we have an AGV pallet truck here. Uh, uh, again, it has a, a bumper that will automatically stop it. And then a unit load carrier uh, here. This one has a roller deck for side loading. Um, I'm more familiar with the type that goes into a station and then it lifts up the unit load, backs out, and lets it down to rest. All right, so when we talk about these different AGV uh, op, uh, applications, the driverless train operations, we're expecting movement of large quantities of material over long distances, right? Very much like a commercial train would do. Um, there can be storage and distribution we, where we're moving pallet loads between shipping and receiving, storage, warehouse, etc. Assembly line applications where we're moving things like car bodies or major sub-assemblies uh, through the uh, assembly plant to the location they're needed. And flexible manufacturing where we're moving parts between the machine tools. All right, so the methods that we use on these automatically guided vehicles so that they follow the pathways. Well, embedded wire uh, guide wires uh, are a very uh, popular method. Um, you cut a very narrow trench in your concrete, you put the wire in, you cover it over, you have no more worries uh, about it. Using paint strips or magnetic tape, you have the problem that the paint strip may become smudged uh, and uh, the vehicle may not be able to follow it. Uh, same thing with the magnetic tape. You can have uh, laser guided vehicles. Uh, I've never seen that technology actually in use. And you can have inertial uh, navigation that either works with a uh, kind of an internal GPS system in a, in a facility or works with, um, uh, uh, works on an actual GPS system inside the AGV. All right, so here we're seeing an AGV with a guide wire, right? Just by running a current through the wire, we have an electromagnetic field that the AGV can sense. Um, and um, this works great. I'm familiar with AGVs that work on this principle. The only thing that happens is sometimes something trips the AGV and it gets a little too far off from the wire and then it has to just sit there and beep until somebody comes and puts it back up in the right position. All right, so when we talk about vehicle management, and of course in a facility of any size, we are going to have this problem where we have uh, uh, the possibility of not only uh, human-guided, powered vehicles uh, and 
uh, and human guided unpowered vehicles uh, and uh, uh, we may have a mixture of that in with automatically guided vehicles. So first aspect is traffic control. We don't want interference between our vehicles and we want to prevent collisions. Well, we need uh, forward sensing, uh, of course. Uh, when we're talking about humans, they are expected to be the forward sensor. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, of course, we want to make sure that we have strict safety protocols in place for them. Uh, the other idea is zone control. So we may have pathways for people that are uh, pushing or pulling a load in a human-powered uh, load aspect. We may have paths for powered vehicles, uh, whether that's a mixture of human-operated ones and AGVs, or we may have totally separate paths for AGVs. The other aspect of vehicle management is vehicle dispatching. Um, to me, it's always best if we have a schedule that we rarely have to change where, uh, uh, where certain things are done at certain times um, and if we have to do, if we have to do any dispatching, it's for special uh, needs. So we can have an onboard control panel, uh, remote call stations, or central computer control. Um, when we're building this, we always want to start with uh, a manual system and build our computer control from there. All right, so here we have uh, an example of zone control where we have a guide path we have our AGV number one in zone A, AGV number two in zone B, zone C you'll notice is empty, and AGV number three is in um, uh, zone D. Um, so zone control means that zones A, B, and D are blocked but a, zone C is free, uh, right? So as AGV1 moves out of zone A, then AGV number two would be free to enter zone A. Uh, AGV number three is free to enter zone C right now. All right, so when we're talking about vehicle safety, typically automatically guided vehicles are slower than the walking speed of a human worker. Uh, although, uh, that is not necessarily true if we're talking about a worker that has a disability. We have the vehicle automatically stops, stop if it strays from the guide path. Okay, so there is a certain distance that we call the acquisition distance that it can read the wire and, uh, or other guidance 
and say, yeah, I'm on the right path, I can keep going. When we talk about obstacle detection systems, uh, they are usually in the forward direction, although I have seen AGVs that have both in the forward and backward direction because the machine can go either way. Uh, ultrasonic sensors uh, can be used for that, although sometimes it's a very simple uh, bumper type system where the bumper uh, hits a person or something that's been put in the path and that the slack in a wire that creates tells the machine to put on the brakes. Uh, emergency bumpers, uh, well, I, uh, I just talked about that. Uh, very often you have warning lights and warning sounds uh, on AGVs uh, to, uh, so that people hear them coming, they see them coming, uh, but this should be uh, applied to also to uh, other vehicular traffic like fork trucks, etc. All right, so rail guided vehicles, these are self propelled vehicles, but they're on a fixed rail system. The vehicles operate. Uh, independently. Um, they're driven by electric motors that um, uh, are, are that get their power from an electrified rail. So it's rarely a thing of there's one rail that it's on. Often there's a second rail that is the power rail. Or there could be more than that. Uh, so you have a fixed rail system, although I have seen them where you can do switching very similarly to uh, railroad type switching. Uh, you might have an overhead monorail uh, suspended from the ceiling. Again, I think those are the best kinds. You can have on floor uh, parallel rail, uh, fixed rails, the tracks are generally protruding up from the floor. Again, that can be a trip hazard. So often we have the ability to have variation in our routing. So we have switches, turntables, other ways that we have special track sections where things can be shunted off to the side. For example, um, like any other mechanical device, uh, these overhead rail guided vehicles or on the ground are going to have mechanical difficulties. We're going to need to be able to take them out of service, fix what's wrong with them, and return them to service. All right. Conveyor systems, again, uh, a uh, um, this is uh, uh, material transport. There's all kinds of different uh, conveyor systems. Um, we, uh, however, ordinarily they move materials over fixed paths. Um, and very often in large quantities and volumes. You can occasionally have a flexible conveyor system. Uh, usually you see those in the shipping receiving type of areas uh, uh, where we have to uh, move things to different uh, trucks or different places. So non-powered, the materials are moved by gravity or by the human workers. 
powered um, uh, when we have a uh, powered conveyor uh, that's always on fixed uh, paths. Uh, we use change belts, rollers, uh, other kinds of mechanical devices. Uh, something that's very interesting in this regard is to look at uh, videos of uh, how things are moved in Amazon facilities where you have um, you have conveyors that are used in conjunction with barcode readers and it's actually sorting the packages as they move over the conveyors. So types of uh, conveyors we can have roller conveyors skate wheel type belt conveyors, we might have an in-floor tow line type, uh, overhead trolley conveyors, and cart on a track conveyors. Uh, okay, so you can see it kind of slops over into some of our other types of material handling equipment. So our roller conveyors, you can see it's just a set of rollers. The skate wheel type uh, is a similar idea, but just using skate wheels instead of rollers. A belt type conveyor uh, is, is driven uh, at one end. Uh, in four floor tow line, you'll notice uh, we just have a pin that drops down so that it is caught by a hook and carried along that way. And an overhead trolley uh, where we have a track, uh, usually of an I-beam type, and we have some kind of chain or other circumstance that pulls along our uh, hangers. So carts, uh, cart on track, the carts are riding on a track and they're uh, driven by a spinning tube, uh, right? So this spinning tube in here uh, uh, connects to a drive wheel and uh, and pushes the uh, uh, the cart along. Um, so uh, that drive wheel can be adjusted so that the cart is going faster or slower or even stopped depending on its circumstance. So the types of motions that we might have with powered conveyors, we might have continuous, where the conveyor moves at a constant velocity uh, all the time. Um, or we might have an asynchronous, where our conveyor moves with a stop and go motion. So it may move in between stations. That would probably be with the uh, rhythm, with the ry rhythm of uh, uh, the rhythm of um, uh, the uh, tactile uh, within the facility. We might have uh, other ways of thinking of conveyors. They can be in a single direction. They might be in a continuous loop. Uh, or they might be recirculating. All right, so single direction conveyor, it always goes the same direction, obviously. 
uh, continuous loop, uh, we have a delivery side and then a return side. Uh, so we actually used one of these at the uh, Center for Automatic Identification at Ohio University uh, when I was working there to have it uh, move our uh, carriers around in a circle and they were being read by, uh, by barcode readers. Cranes and hoists uh, are handling devices for lifting, lowering, and transporting materials. Uh, usually we're talking a heavy load. Uh, there are uh, crane and hoist type things for fairly light loads, but usually it's for something pretty uh, heavy. Uh, cranes we use for horizontal movement of materials. Hoists are more for vertical lifting of materials. Uh, cranes include hoists. Uh, so that uh, we have the ability to do horizontal transporting and vertical lifting and lowering. Uh, we can have a very simple kind of hoist uh, such, as, uh, such as we see in these illustrations where we uh, are essentially uh, just using human power that is multiplied um, uh, to uh, hoist things up. Okay, so when we have cranes, we can have a bridge crane. The bridge crane goes back and forth and can go side to side. Um, we can have a, a half gantry crane that does uh, much the same, but um, uh, doesn't necessarily go the width of uh, the width of the work area. And we can have a jib crane where essentially we move things within a polar positioning kind of uh, system. All right. So how do we analyze our material transport systems? Well, one thing that we do is we create from two charts and network diagrams. This is going to tell us what is, um, where are the largest amounts being moved back and forth and helps guide us on our decisions of what kind of material of moving equipment we should use. So the types of things we might use, industrial trucks, AGVs, rail guided vehicles, uh, or we might use asynchronous uh, conveyor options. When we talk about conveyor analysis, we're going to talk about should we be worried about single direction conveyors, closed loop conveyors, recirculating conveyor systems. All right, so here we have a network diagram that shows uh, deliveries between our loading and unloading stations. Okay, so from one, things might go uh, from one to two, one to three, or one to four. From two, they would only go to five. From three, they might go to five, or they might go to four, and from four, they only go to five, right? So it shows how much 
of the load as, um, is uh, uh, is going on each of these pads. Okay, well, wasn't that exciting? Okay, so, <laughs> so, that is a very quick and dirty look at our material transport systems. Um, we talk some more about this in uh, facility design uh, and uh, and some of the uh, how to create things like from two charts and uh, network analysis. Um, so let's see. Um, da, da, da. Uh, all right, I am going to uh, end this here, and I am then going to do a bonus video on what I consider important for the midterm um, that will I will also post.